Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Karvan Crafts Foundation. Today, I have with me two very special guests. I have Zara Hamid and Usman Raza Jameel. They are a married couple here living in Lahore. And they've got a very important story to share here with us. I am in awe of their bravery. I have been blown away by their raw honesty. They released two videos, one which featured Zara, the other which featured Usman, talking about Zara's mental illness, which consists of bipolar two, and Usman's story of how he's had to cope with it, manage with it, and help Zara, and Zara helped him build together a family. Zara, Usman, thank you so very much for being here with us and sharing your story. I am truly grateful to you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. It's a pleasure. Now, thank you so much, Meher. Not at all. Now, I'm going to throw in a bit of a personal touch here. Um, Zara, I, I, I know, I've known you for a while. You're a family friend. And Usman, of course, I knew you through a, a friend. Um, I was always, I always knew about you guys as being a very lovey-dovey couple. You know, your romance was often sort of said, Ke, oh, yaar, Zara and Usman, what a couple. How was it when you guys first met? Zara, I'd like to start with you. When did you, you say that you were diagnosed with depression. Is this before you met Usman? Well, uh, uh, Meher, Usman and I met when we were 14. Okay. We were quite young. Mm -hmm. We met in the mountains in Nathagali. We were there for a family um, holiday. And yeah. during that time, we were very young and I was not diagnosed as depressed at 14. Uh, right. So initially, for the first few years that we knew each other, I was not diagnosed. And um, even though I think at around 16, my mother did expect that there was something slightly amiss about my temper. And she did take me to a, um, um, a, a psychologist uh, but I was not diagnosed yet with um, being depressed. It took yeah. a while yeah. before, you know, because it's a process. When you go to the doctor, we go to a psychologist, a therapist. It means many, many visits and hours, uh, sometimes extensive testing, which happened in my case also, before they can come up with the, that diagnosis. Yeah. So we met in the mountains and uh, that's how we became friends. And uh, then... Uh, Usman? Yeah, so we <laughs> met in the mountains, we became friends, and then we got married uh, subsequently. Uh, yeah. I knew yeah. I knew about her, I knew somewhat about her depression, probably around four or five years uh, into knowing one another, but uh, not about the severity of it, for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, when was it that you first realized within yourself that I'm not happy or what, what see this is now my assumption that being depressed when a person is depressed they just they know okay achha, i'm not happy when was it when you realized that i am depressed what made you think you know Meher, i don't think you come up with that term depressed i think yeah. we use that term far more easily now than we did let's say 20 years ago uh, because yeah. now depressed is a very uh, is a very common term that everybody, including my twelve year old, uses. I'm feeling depressed, uh, but it's a very it's a very uh, serious medical term, and yeah. um, it's 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 another now it's interchangeably being used for you know I'm feeling low or today I'm feeling uh, you know it's 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 being used more as an adjective uh, to yeah. describe um, yeah. your mood. Uh, mm -hmm. rather than a condition, right? Mm -hmm. So it's actually a condition mm -hmm. and it's not necessarily a mood. So uh, for me, I was not able to uh, diagnose myself as depressed on my own. Um, yeah. I knew that I was, I had, a, you know, I was feeling very, very, like I would get very emotional. I would get very angry. I would, yeah. Um, yeah. I would cry a lot. In fact, everybody used to call me a crybaby when I was growing up. And, and I was like, uh, why am I being, because I would just cry a lot and 
cry incessantly this morning if you remember and people were like tum itna roti ho aur tum har baat pe roti ho roti chali jaati ho you know but those are early signs really now that i look back i'm like those are actually signs and um, uh, it was not till i again till i went in for um, analysis uh, and i went in to see um, a psychologist that i realized that i was like i had periods of being clinically depressed it was yeah. you know Yeah, yeah. Smart Zara says that she used to cry incessantly. When those crying bouts would come on, what were your thoughts? Would you sort of, I mean, if I cry now, my husband would be like, "Yeah, bas kar do, yeah, up to you know, enough is enough." But what was your sort of reaction? Were you were you puzzled? I mean, generally speaking, जब कोई रोता है हमारे मुआवशर में देते हैं कि या तो शादी करा दो या पते नहीं यू नो बच्चा और पैदा कर दो ठीक हो जाएंगे What was your reaction to her about crying? How did you handle it? Seeing someone that you love in so much pain for an unknown reason. Are we talking about pre-marriage or post-marriage? Um, <laughs> pre-marriage. Okay, so uh, pre-marriage, I think initially when I saw Zara crying and whenever she did cry, obviously my first response would be, "Man, I didn't do anything." Yeah. So after once we're we're done with that. then um uh you know uh, i have had the uh, privilege of of living abroad for the first 11 12 years of my life so yeah. i in i predominantly went to coeducational schools so i uh, was able to interact with uh, with girls as well in school um you know so uh, when she when she when she did have a crying bouts then yes at times uh, when they were you know quite uh, uh, when the tears were flowing tremendously then of course you know it, it uh, i was taken aback by it and i do my best to comfort her um, but uh, uh, you know i i just thought that she was just a very emotional person yeah yeah i mean that it's it's very simple that you know um, even now with all this conversation about mental illness um when when people say ki i'm depressed abhi bhi log kehte hain ki ji drama kar rahe hain ya bas i mean wo to sen wo to ji sensitive se log hain which is not exactly true because it just means that you know it's it's often a cry for help would i be wrong in yes. saying that sara absolutely i think one of the first things people especially if you're a woman they'll say oh are you pmsing you yes. is it a, you know oh yeah. you must be pmsing it must be a time of the month and i find that quite offensive because i'm like okay sure yes we all women or do pms and it's a it's a completely um, you know hormonal uh, situation where you do feel more um, you know you do feel more emotional than normal and uh, but um, but you know to equate that with depression or to equate that with um, you know um, to equate that with uh, you know uh, uh, what i'm trying to say is that the first thing that they point out yeah. is that you're uh-huh. messing and uh, sure. but so i uh-huh. what was your question i'm i've on a little off track i was just saying that you know when when people cry they just sort of um say ki you you sensitive se hai log and that's it in your video you said that you you were diagnosed um the medication that was given to you was prozac now yes Prozac. I mean, you've been taking that for a long, long time. Yes. Did it help you, Zara, at that time? Even after when you got married, did it help you? It's a very difficult question, you know, uh, in retrospect. But I believed at that point that it was helping me. That's why yeah. I took it. Uh-huh. I actually thought that this is not my fault. I was very low. I was going through. I went through back-to-back pregnancies, uh, three pregnancies. Yes. Uh, and uski under, I lost one. I had two, and they were all a year, literally a year apart. So during that, uh, thank you. During that day, you know, I was on Prozac, and the Prozac helped me uh, cope with um, the pregnancies and be able to have a pregnancy, go through. my like you know um, well i didn't even i wouldn't even make it to full term because i would just make it to the first day of the ninth month uh, for both my children 
because of my mental condition, it had such an adverse effect on yeah. my physical yeah. condition that I would get physically very, very sick. But the Prozac yeah. did help yeah. me and I did do all my research. Ki can I, what is the safest drug that I can take? Uh, what is the safest drug that I can take while being pregnant um, uh, for my child and myself that keeps me sane and that lets my pregnancy uh, remain? Absolutely. You know. Absolutely, absolutely. Zara, it's very interesting that you said that you did your research. Did the gynecologist or did your um, doctors not offer any advice or any constructive, um, you know, shed any light considering that you had lost a child and that you were having children back to back and you were on Prozac? Did they never speak to you about the impact it was going to have on your mental health if you would go off it or if you were to stay on it? They didn't. They didn't. Yeah, they don't. They don't. Because I'll, I'll, I'll be very honest with you. I had, I went through three gynecologists over my period of three pregnancies. And uh, the first one uh, was with the top doctors in the world. As we always try and go to the best people. And those yeah. uh, were very were experiences whereby I saw that I, even though I went to the best gynecologist, they did not have the time of day for their patients. And it was very much a uh, walk in, walk out, 10 minutes, I will see you for 10 minutes situation, which is often the case with very famous doctors. They don't have yes. the time for it because they have too many patients. And maybe a lot of women for the average person, if they don't have a mental condition, that's okay. Uh, but for somebody like me who has a special situation, I needed a doctor who would explain things to me and talk to me. So for my second pregnancy with my daughter, which which was a, which was a full term pregnancy, I uh, chose a doctor who was more hands on. She was a younger female doctor, a female gynecologist, yeah. and um, she did uh, help me. She knew about my condition and she said, "Look." For us, the most important thing is your health and the baby's health. And you have to understand that uh, we have to get you through this pregnancy without yeah. any major uh, problem, right? And if yeah. that means bed rest, you bed rest, you know? If that means that you cannot work, you cannot work. If, but did that make me more depressed? Yes, because if you, are, if you are already depressed and then you're on Prozac and then you're put on bed rest, which yeah. obviously yeah. means that you cannot move. So you up or depressed to that thing, I'm bed, you know? So it adds on. And the people around you don't necessarily uh, always know what that means. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. In fact, that was exactly what my next question was going to be, that what were the people around you like? I mean, Usman, how did you feel seeing Zara go through these pregnancies and struggle with a lack of medical support that really should have been there. I mean, did you try to fill in? Did you try to do your own research? And, and it's so heartbreaking that you have to do research on your own. You know, it's... Absolutely. Oh uh, yeah, it was, it was terrible. I mean, like, you know, I mean, after, uh, you know, we lost uh, the first baby, though, so, you know, Zara went, was, was very low. Um, and, you know, I mean, it, during the second pregnancy, she was working, you know, uh, up to almost one month or the, almost two, three weeks before I was born. So, you know, I mean, what she had to endure, what she had to go through, uh, you know, I, I mean, I tried doing whatever research I could, but that was, you know, I mean, no doctor would ever talk to us about these things. And, you know, I just, you know, sort of learned as we went along, you know. That's all I and that, possibly do. That's not the way it's supposed to be. That's so wrong on so many Absolutely. levels. Absolutely. You know, Mehir, if I may... The fact that you were working with no medical... Sorry, Bolo. I just, you know, throughout my pregnancies, my only and only question was that we spend all these years in school, you know, preparing yeah. for jobs preparing our children for college and preparing for life uh, through different subjects that are taught to us, right? And I yeah. even had yeah. subjects like home management in my O-levels. I had subjects like food and nutrition, 
but there's never a subject that teaches you about motherhood or a subject that teaches you about fatherhood or how to be a good father how to be a father yeah. how to be yeah. a mother yeah. and yet it's yeah. one of the most important jobs and roles you will ever partake in your life and the role that you are least prepared for and yeah. there is no yeah. college for it so you're on a you know um you're on a you literally on a you you're sitting with all those books you're sitting on the website so you're you're talking to google ma yeah. and you are yeah. like okay uh, help me uh so yeah. i really feel yeah. that that's really important that our curriculum needs to have inclusion of uh you know a motherhood and fatherhood as subjects uh in them because these yeah. are subjects yeah. that, that that nobody can sort of teach you uh and you just have to learn uh, literally on the job absolutely i mean for people that's obsessed with marriage and children you think that there'd be more of an open dialogue but this is something that in my own personal struggles with motherhood and my own consequential mental issues with it it was always you know you were sort of pushed out to sea and and expecting to swim to find your own shore which is it's, it's cruel it's cruel but i i i mean what 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 really sort of strikes me is that you had each other zara and usman and i am assuming that both of you had supportive um parents and extended family which would supposedly make a difference in terms uh, of understanding um what uh, you guys were going through suffering were, were they able to help or were they i mean like all families they just sort of said in kuch chhod do inko bas theek ho jayenge you know theek ho jayenge or were your family uh, support sorry the the question support uh, what type of support are you talking about i'm talking about emotional support understanding trying to help you sort of understand that you know what you're going through we're here for you How, what can we do to help you coming forth and acknowledging the struggles that both of you are facing in your own respective ways many I, i think i think we did we did get uh, you know the best family support that we could have gotten uh, yeah. you know everyone was uh, sympathetic um, and you know we we're, we're blessed to have a uh, loving family and loving friends around us and no doubt we got support mm-hmm. from them uh, you know and mm-hmm. i think like i said it was uh, for the times that we were in and for whatever it is that we were going through it was the best that uh, could be given and we're very grateful for it absolutely so i'd like to ask you when you had your children and and by now you you know you you had you have two children um how did you how did you find motherhood and i assume that after the children were born you didn't go back onto prosa or you did well i was still undiagnosed as far as being bipolar was concerned yeah. right yeah. so that came the bipolar diagnosis came much later i just knew that i was clinically depressed and i was on prozac but once yeah. i had the children and this is what i didn't realize was a part of my bipolar was that basically bipolar is a mood disorder right so you are uh, it's you're okay. swinging between a very high elation elated happy mood and then a very low mood right so in oh. my low moods my low moods were still obvious to me and for those i was on prozac right but for my high moods um i wasn't really going and seeing my uh, psychologist when i was really oh. high or when i was in a very very good place because obviously that's when you feel you're on top of the world and you think you don't need anyone yeah. and so when i was in those states in that time frame even after after the children were born um even though i was um you know i was plunged by um you know um uh, postpartum depression uh, and it was sort of excavated because i had my own depression and then on top of that i had double the depression of two pregnancies back to back and then i had c section so that meant that my body was also having a physical breakdown physically right so there was all this healing that had to happen mentally and physically but still my mood was swinging um because of my bipolar and um yeah. because of yeah. my high i felt at times that oh I, i was fine 
which is a normal thing in bipolar. And I thought, okay, I'm fine. I'm actually okay. I've got this and I can leave my medication. And I left it cold turkey without telling my doctor. And when that did happen, I did plunge into very, very, very uh, deep depression and um, anger. And that was really, really hard. And yeah. I had a um, you know, helping me out every second of the day, which he did. He was very hands-on as a father. And yeah. Uh, yeah. He, he, you know, helped me every single day at night. He would let me sleep because sleep deprivation, as you know, is so difficult even for normal mothers. Imagine if you're bipolar, it's just worse. Yeah. You know, it gets deprivated. So he oh. helped me. So I'm really grateful to him for that. Absolutely. Uh, how did you feel when Zara decided to stop taking um, Prozac and go cold turkey? Was that a decision you supported? Did you think that, all right, this is the right thing to do? Or were you, did you have concerns about how it would impact, her, especially after having children, what women go through is... I don't think anyone understands fully what happens to us. We can't understand what happens to be frank, I didn't know she, she stopped having it. She okay. just stopped having it. You know, I yeah. mean, it, it just, uh, it was a decision she made uh, without telling me, uh, without consulting with any doctors. Mm. So it was a decision she made. And, you know, it, I mean, after that, uh, whatever was happening, it was just, just really, really tough because yeah. uh, I yeah. had no clue what to do. It just didn't. Absolutely, absolutely. Zara, did you ever get um, hit by, by, you know how some moms get hit by maternal guilt? Like you're constantly told, did that sort of, did you have to face that as well? And did that sort of act as, as, as something that, that affected you mentally? Absolutely. I think... Uh... I think it's very subcontinental. I think it's all yeah. around us. Um, every single person who walks in has an opinion and tells you exactly yeah. what they think you should yeah. be doing. Yeah. And uh, it's very goes. hard not to get yeah. offended. There's no doubt about that. Uh, and, um, but I think what I tried to do was that initially I remember getting offended by it, but as I got into the second pregnancy and I had this I had Vyad first, I had Vyad, then Vyad. Um, I, uh, I couldn't go. Uh, and um, one, of my, um, one of my very close friends, she sent me a nurse, uh, yeah. an amazing yeah. nurse, as a present for a, few, for a few weeks. And when this lady arrived, it was like God had sent, like the clouds had departed and this angel had like, yeah. arrived in our house. Because here was somebody who was completely non-judgmental and a professional. And she, within a matter of three to four weeks, taught me everything I really needed to know. And she helped us smile. She taught us how to take care of Raya. And we were first-time parents, and it was very hard. Yes. Um, and yeah. uh, we had parents who were also young parents, grandparents, and working grandparents. And so, you know, we needed that support. So... That was like, you know, so God does intervene and help you and send his angels. I believe in that. I believe that there is divine intervention and aapko madad aapki taraf aati hai when you are really seeking it. So, uh, so we were lucky in that respect at that time. Absolutely. Absolutely. How did you push with work, with two small children with Zara, with, with her condition still undiagnosed, you still, you still assume that it's depression, you don't know if it's bipolar. How did you cope with all of this? I, I, I didn't cope well at all. Uh, when Zara miscarried in 2007, uh, my work, it was very stressful at the time. Uh, I broke into uh, these rashes and these spots on my body. I didn't know what they yeah. were. Yeah. I went to a dermatologist. He misdiagnosed me for having scabies. Then I went to two different doctors and they told me I have psoriasis. And yeah. I've had psoriasis now for 11, uh, for actually uh, 
uh, almost 13 years now. So with all of this happening, uh, with Zara's depression and uh, with having young kids, working uh, and dealing with, the, with my stress levels, uh, it, was, it was really tough. It was really tough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure. Um, and psoriasis. Point, sorry, go ahead. I just want to say that even though we're talking about, I mean, psoriasis also has a direct connection to stress. Yeah. Right? And so it also has a, a direct connection to your mental state and how you're feeling. So I think yeah. all of these things have, they're, they're like a threat. You know, you can thread them all together and understand, you know, how we cope. This is how we cope sometimes or how we react, uh, yeah. how we analyze things and then how they come out. No, absolutely. absolutely. Zara, at what, what stage did you get diagnosed with bipolar 2? Could you sort of tell us about how you got to that point where you were finally diagnosed? Was it something that Usman said to you that, look, I mean, in, in, in your video that you released, Usman, you said that you sat Zara down and you said, look, we need to do something, you know? And what was that? Was, was there a breaking point that you had reached that bus enough is enough? Or was it something that triggered you guys that things are getting out of hand? We really need to know what is going on. Yeah? Yeah, I think we were, so, I think we were... How, Swimming in a vast ocean of not knowing, uh, and yeah. uh, we we were having a very hard time. And I think um, there were many breaking points, many many very hard breaking points in our life, in our relationship. And um, after one of those, uh, I remember, which was almost a situation of life and death. Usman came to me and he said, he brought me this file. So I've got this file with us. So I'm going to share this file with you. Usman show me the file. So this is a file. Please if you see the date on it, it's from 2014. And it says my name. And it says the file. And this file, Usman made this file and back then, I can't believe he made this file. He made this huge file. He did all this research and he made this file. And for the longest time, I didn't even look at this file. I'm ashamed to admit because I was so scared of this file, um, of what it held and what it meant. Um, but Usman will read to you what he wrote in it. And just before I read what I wrote, uh, I must put some context here. You know, I mean, it was that much of a breaking point because when we were together before marriage, Zara and I never fought. Never. I mean, she'd try and fight with me, but I wouldn't fight with her. When we got married, you know, everyone told us the first two years is the toughest and whatnot. So, yeah, yeah then we started, you know, having a few arguments here and there. But by 2013, 14, with the stresses of life, work, raising two children, and also the onset of Zara's bipolar 2 reaching at, I, th I think maybe at least for what I saw was its peak, uh, you know, then it, uh, you know, then they had to, they did become that breaking point, both of us. Yeah. So yeah. Once I did my research and made this file, uh, I remember very distinctly giving this file to Zara. And, you know, I'm just going to read quickly what I wrote in the, in the inset of the file. So yeah. it says, Zara, the contents of this file may scare you. They may upset you and they may make you feel sleepy and make you feel angry. But please know this much when you read it. One, we love you and we believe in you. Two, you are the center of our universe. Without you, Raya, Rai, and me are lost. Three, you will get better, inshallah. You just have to believe in you. Four, we are always there for you no matter what. Five, please don't give up on us and on yourself. Six, everything you do, you simply are the best in our eyes. And we, then I ended it with, you are not and will never be alone in this. We always are always in it together. You and your life are important to us and important to the world. So I gave this file to her. And I remember Raya, 
she took this file from me. She didn't know anything about what was going on. And then she scribbled on it, Mama, it says away, you might be able to see it in the mark. Mama, you are the best. So this file I gave to her and it had lots of articles on bipolar 2 and how to deal with bipolar 2 and, you know. Um, so yeah, I mean, that was that was the beginning. Yeah. Zara, you mentioned that there was this um, doctor who said that he will see, he or she, I, 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 will see you when you're institutionalized. I mean, to me, that just, that's just, I, I find that such an inhumane statement to say to someone who's come to you for help. And I guess they just give you that sort of, and that's just inhumane. I mean, I don't know who this doctor is, but if they're listening, you're inhuman for saying such a thing to someone. That could not have been easy for you. Did you ever lose hope in finding a solution, uh, an answer at some point? Did you ever think, what is the point of all of this? Why should I even, after hearing this answer from a, a doctor, a professional, somebody that you reached out to for help, how did you feel? I thought maybe I belonged in one. There were many times I felt I, I, I might belong in one. There were many times people said those things to me to my face, um, that that is where you're going to end up. Um, and that's where we would, uh, we think you're going to end up in an institution. But the thing is, uh, Meher, um, even though I went to this, the same doctor's uh, clinic, I was being seen by his junior and he over medicated me to the point where I could barely talk. And every time I would sit there waiting for my turn, uh, see this uh, uh, person, I would see all the other patients who were institutionalized sitting there. Yeah. I would always think there isn't much difference to cross, to go over the other side. It doesn't take a lot. It's just a few bad incidents. It's yeah. just, you're just one bad incident away from being institutionalized. You know, and uh, that's why I, um, I I made a promise. I made a promise to myself, to my children, to my husband, that I'm not going to cross over to the other side, and that we're going to do our best as a family to make sure yeah. that I do and we do everything in our possibly in our power in terms of therapy, in terms of medication, in terms of exercise, in terms of meditation, whatever it is, prayer, whatever it takes um, yeah. To, yeah. to stay on, on this side of life rather than pass. Because once you pass over into the institutionalized side of life, it's very hard to come back. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, your children are now, um, you know, I, I'm sure they're aware of what you, as, your, as their mom, has, has gone through. And I'm certain as well, they've seen what you've had to do as a man, as a husband, as a father, as a human, to support Zara in, in her struggle with bipolar two. Do they ask you questions? Have you ever spoken to them about um, mental health? Like Zara, you mentioned that, you know, children today, um, so they use depressed as an adjective. Have you tried to, do you converse with your children about these issues? That these are words not to be thrown around so lightly? Yes, um, we do. We have from the beginning. I think we yeah. waited till they were old enough to talk. Usman did tell them very early on that your mom is not well. That was a, the basic term that he would use with her to help them understand. A mom is not well, she needs to sleep. You know, he would he try to explain it to them when they were younger. And as they grew up and now they are 12 and 11, mashallah. So, you know, we have something that we call family circle, which is like 45 minutes of us sitting together and just talking about how we feel and what's going on and, you know, uh, how each person is feeling or if, there's something to resolve or talk about. 
And <clears throat> within that family circle, we have talked about um, mental health, mental conditions, what bipolar is, what bipolar 2 is, what depression is. Sure. So the children are quite, quite um, aware and quite sensitive. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Usman, how do you feel about it? Do you feel comfortable speaking to your children about mental illness, considering that there is a rise of it in Pakistan and there are signs of it that I think our generation is slightly more aware and open to these things than say our parents' generation. And I, I wouldn't blame them because that's the best that they knew. You know, but sub tike, baat nahi karna. Acha bas chup kar jao, kisi ko batana nahi hai. Whereas our generation, we see signs, we see things. Um, would you encourage more men to come forth and and tell them that guys, you need to sort of step up as well and acknowledge these these issues that surround children, surround women, surround men as well. Uh, yeah, it's a very good point, man. I, I, you know, you, uh, you mentioned that, you know, our parents did the best that they could. And, you know, there's no doubt about that. You know, hats off to them, kudos to them. But quite frankly, given the resources that we have, the information that we have, we have to be a lot better than them vis-a-vis yeah. -vis yeah. And we, uh, you know, are blessed to live in such times where uh, we actually can have those conversations with our children because they're so aware of things now because they have access to the internet and to you know countless resources so the point is it is absolutely essential yes uh, for us men as fathers as husbands uh, to talk about this and to not follow our fathers and their forefathers that's not good enough and if we do that, then we're really failing our children and our partners. Absolutely. 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 I mean, I, I you know, um, Karvan, for example, we work with a lot of rural women. And Aksar, you know, it's happened far, far too many times for comfort now. We'll hear about these cases. And it's a struggle because you know, those varying generations come in. You have the older generation just saying, ki, Haan, bas ke dam lo, kuch nahi hoga, de do. whereas our generation, when we hear these stories, we want to sort of be like, no, doctor. Ke paas le but way it has, awareness has to come about. And I think what you, Zara, have done, what you've done is in because you owned it. I don't think you realize how powerful this step is. Because they they that that urban areas maybe, you'll hear about women. I'm, I mean, friends, you know, Lahore is so small, for example, I'm sure we know everyone. Friends, you hear about, and you see those signs in them, and you're like, dude, are you okay? And they'd be like, yeah, of course. And you're like, nay, nay, let's have, it's about acknowledging that, you know what, I'm not okay. And that's okay too. And I think that's such a huge step to acknowledge it, to own it in your entirety. I mean, as well, also, how do you to feel when God decided to talk about this? I think seeking help for it is very important. I think one of the most important things that has helped me get to this point has been therapy. Um, I've been in therapy yeah. with a very good therapist. I've been uh, going to a very good psychiatrist now for a good four or five years. And consistently I have been going, yeah. which means every week I see these people for the last four years, five years. And that has slowly, 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 along with other practice and structure exercises has brought me to the point where I am now in a place where I can be this person that I am today with the support of my family, with the help of these people. So I think 
therapy is very important even when i went abroad for example i went to the uk for a holiday um, with usman and the kids i went to a uk support uh, group for bipolar and i was so surprised by this group because i went there were more than 100 people in the support group and all age groups all income income brackets and um, and they welcomed me somebody who was just a visitor and they said please come and yes if you're bipolar you may join and i i spent like um a, like a meeting with them and then now i'm in touch with them uh, you know i can i'm on doing the online sessions with them but for example when my therapist tried to do a support group in lahore he didn't get the response that he thought he would get even though he has many bipolar patients so he only got three people out of a group of like many people who actually came for a support group of course that support group was still very helpful to me and the people who were there yeah but yeah. you know i was just comparing it to the group of 100 and the group of 3 you know um and yeah. but somewhere everything has to start somewhere and i think that agar hum you know if we if we can start with self if we can start with awareness if we can go into therapy if we can you know start with that only itna se hum shuru kar le to at least we can begin that journey absolutely you know? absolutely so i just i'm sorry just just to add to what she said um i am also able to talk about all of this because of that yeah. you know when zara you know went through the initial phase and she was coming out of it and she was a bit stronger she then said you know recognize ki usman now you need it now you need it because you need you have dealt with a lot and you have not you have internalized most of it um and you need to talk about things you need to be able to express yourself so therapy has helped me tremendously yeah. and it's come uh, and you know it, it's given me the ability to be articulate about being a caregiver and okay. aside from my support group there should be a caregiver support group as well of course that's very important you know oh, yeah. because um, giving for, for those people who are brave enough you know because you know we read we read countless articles and you know see different various reports and videos of bipolar two couples and you know the startling uh, or, or not the not not the shocking sort of you know statistic is is that those marriages end up in divorce and separation obviously because the spouse can't take it whichever spouse is the uh, whichever yeah. spouse is having yeah. the care yeah. so, so so the caregivers okay. are are equally if not more important than the patients themselves because it's the caregivers who are, who are, who, are, who, are, who uh, if their antenna are up will be alert to any uh, issues and any sort of you know uh, triggers that happen to their partners Bilkul, absolutely. I completely agree with you. And again, that's a very important role of the caretaker, the caregiver. Yes. That's just dismissed so easily. There's zero acknowledgement yes. of that. Bilkul. And there are these cookie cutter roles that you're supposed to fall into. You know, husband, father, son, brother. You know, walking, talking, ATM, and that's it. And you're just like, well, no. Hang on a second. There's a lot more that I do. mentally emotionally and that's not it right yes. There, there's no acknowledgement so what i'd like to ask you guys um this is my final question and then the floor is all yours um this was such i cannot emphasize this enough this was such a huge step that you guys have taken about speaking about this publicly where would you like to take it what is your goal i mean zara i know you've set up a platform pakistan's first platform celebrating curvy women um and curvy girls body positivity and mental health and i think that's remarkable because there's nothing like that in pakistan and this is a country that i often say we have national ptsd everyone is suffering from it from some form or the other at least ptsd to har kisi ko hai hi hai where would you like to do where where do you see taking you know this platform forward what would you like to do with it? would you like to encourage more people to come forward and and speak to you do you want more people to share their stories and like you like you i mean you are a real life hero acknowledge and own their 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 truth embrace themselves 
in their entirety. Is that what you would like to see? Absolutely. I think Mehed, that is the dream. I think since I was since I was very young, for me, your personal story is the most important story. Yeah. Um, I think because it's the story of your soul, it's the story of your truth. And every person, every human being has that truth, no matter where they are from, where, which country they are from, which, where, which, whatever nationality they have. So that's why the platform is all about positivity and inclusion and diversity. Sure. Because sure. it celebrates that. It says that, you know, you know what, we, your story is so important that your story deserves to be heard. Which is why I started Divane Zara, Your Story, Aapki Kahani. And which is a, every Monday, I started with my own story. And when I started yeah. telling my story, I said, my story is incomplete without Usman. Because he is a part of the story, right? So it can't be a one-sided story. The story has to have the full story. And not a one-sided story. So I would love for more people to come forward with their stories and let it be a global platform where people come and feel safe in a safe space and talk about their story. And incidentally, I have had people in just this week get in touch with me from different parts of the world um, and they would share their stories. And that is, a, like for me, that is enough. You know, I think for me, that's the best part. And everything else, I hope, flows and grows from it, you know. So I'm very grateful. I'm very, very grateful and very, very happy to be here. And thank you so much for having us. Not at all. Not at all. Usman, I hope you take this forward too. Like you said, you pinpointed that a group um, for caretakers and caregivers should definitely be their support group. I think what you've done is also phenomenal because, you know, our men are meant to be real life Mola Jaks and that's about it. And you've sort of taken that and said, yes, but there's also another side to that Mola Jakness and let's talk about it. I really hope you continue it. Hey, uh, I, you know, I mean, um, I was very lucky that uh, Zara asked me to do that and, uh, you know, um, uh, I would be more than happy uh, to see uh, other people, uh, other, other men who are in similar position to me uh, to be able to speak yeah. about it, you know, because it's, it's, it's very important. And, you know, I think uh, it, it is the most overlooked part of mental illness of, you know, the, the role of the caregiver. And, you know, I, I, I sincerely hope that, you know, um, my speaking, uh, will enable others to be able to speak on this as well and share their experiences because I mean those experiences are very very important in uh, in saving a relationship. So I think. Oh, um, Go ahead. No, but I think we um, do about creativity about it's just about creating awareness. That is one of our basic goals. We're creating a space where people can come and tell their stories, and also creating a, a safe space where people feel free to go to therapy, and also to you know encourage that, encourage support groups, and encourage dialogue. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, we're nearing the end of. The the session now. So once again, Zara, Usman, thank you so very much for agreeing to do this. I'm, I'm in total awe of you guys, even more so now. Thank you so much. You've done a great service to the country, to Pakistanis. And for all those who have a mental illness and those who are looking after those who Thank you. It's been a privilege. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you so much, Ben. Thank you, guys. Take care. Good night. Take care. Take care. Good, Good night. Bye-bye.